John, the, you, you've talked about the emergence of the Ivy League, whom we in effect heard on, on that Who record, and the fact that they made quite a lot of records in their own right. Could that group have, have gone on for longer than it did, do you think? It probably could have done if I'd have uh, managed to stick out the actual touring part of it. But that really, I found very exhausting. And also, it was keeping me away from my, my main love, which was songwriting and being in the studio making records. Yes. I think when you're on the road and you've had a couple of successful records, the pressure builds up and uh, you tend to accept more dates than you should. And you're driving from Aberdeen to Portsmouth you know, overnight in order to get to another gig. And this really made my... Uh, it's, my songwriting started to suffer. And I just wanted to get back to being a backroom boy then. Now, at what stage did you write that song, Can't You Hear My Heartbeat? And did you record that yourself at all? Uh, no, Can't You Hear My Heartbeat was, uh, was written... Uh, Purely as a song, a, a, a demo was made and played to Mickey Most, who said, I love this song, I want to do it with a group I've, I've just signed called The Animals. Now, if you know the song, Can't You Hear My Heartbeat, you, you think this is rather strange for, us, <laughs> for the animals. Yes. <laughs> and also, the animals felt exactly the same way. So <laughs> they said, no, thank you, Mickey. But Alan Price was impressed with the song, and uh, he, he actually went on to record it with a, a girl group. Um, called Goldie and Ginger Bits. They were an American all-girl trio, mm, weren't that's they? Right. And they could actually play their instruments. They were quite a revelation. Goldie was the drummer. Mm. Good group, very good group. And she had a, a great sort of raunchy voice. And uh, they recorded Can't You Hear My Heartbeat, and it uh, was a hit in Britain. But eventually Mickey recorded it with um, Herman's Hermits, and uh, that went on to sell a million in the States, went to number one, and um, also appeared as the B-side of Silhouettes over here, selling another 250,000. So we did quite well out of that. Well, quite well, he's putting it mildly. I mean, it must be one of your, your biggest successes, really, yeah, absolutely. as a writer. So, what was the, the Ivy League's first record under their own name? first record by the Ivy League was called What More Do You Want, which was a total disaster. It almost made us give up as the Ivy League, uh, because uh, nothing happened to it at all. But were you into very much your own thing, or were you still being steered by a music publisher and a manager? Well, we were greatly steered by our manager, Terry Kennedy, I think, who was always very enthusiastic to get us in the studio as much as possible to experiment with songs we were writing instead of just making demos to make finished records. I think this was the early days of um, independent production. I think we were maybe one of the first people to try independent production rather than being signed to a record company. Yes, this is where I was getting at. We were actually signed to the publishing company and we made our own records, had complete artistic license. Who then was the deciding factor in not giving up as the Ivy League after that first well, disaster? Well, I, I think it was when we, we wrote a song called Funny How Love Can Be, shortly after that. Um, in fact, we demoed it purely as a song. Ken and I wrote it and um, played it to John Schroeder, who's the label manager at Pie Piccadilly, mm -hmm. because he said he had this group called the Rocking Berries who specialised in four sets. They were from Birmingham too, right? They were from Birmingham, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Schroeder actually recorded it with the Rocking Berries. But by this time, I think we, we felt there was something special about this song. So our manager, Terry uh, Kennedy, really advised us that we should go in the studio and try it ourselves, which we did. And when it turned out OK, we had to persuade John Schroeder, because we were on the same label, so we were <laughs> both on Pipe Piccadilly. We had to persuade John Schroeder to um, hold up the release of uh, the Rocking Berries version and put our version out instead. So by this time, I think he'd found he's in town for the Rocking Berries, so everything worked out okay. Right? It certainly did, but an in interesting situation arises nevertheless. So let's, let's listen to the, the Ivy League's hit um, with Funny How Love Can Be.
songs that Ben Carter, Ken Nurse's songs, as recorded by the Ivy League, and you told us, John, of the story about how Rocky Bears had actually recorded it and didn't release it as a single, it did nevertheless go on to an album, didn't it? Yes, it was on their very first album. And they're still working, of course, or a group called the Rockin' Bears is still working, yes. travelling around. I wonder if they still sing that song. I don't know. I must go and see them. It'll be worth it. I gather they're very good. Anyway, here's the original group with their version of it. Mm -hmm. 